fourth frame of reference for meditation, or the fourth foundation of mindfulness, the dhammas, which, which can simply mean objects of the mind, it can mean mental qualities. And it's interesting that of the various foundations of mindfulness, this is the one that recommends the most active interaction with what's going on in the mind. For example, if hindrances come up in the mind, you don't simply watch them come and go. First you want to be aware that they're there, and aware of when they're not there. This is an important distinction, because sometimes they're not there when you think they are, and sometimes they're there when you think they aren't. An example of the first case is when you're angry, and the anger flares up and your blood starts racing, your heart starts beating faster. And the actual thought of anger disappears for a while from the mind, but the physical symptoms of anger are still there. And so you assume, well, there must still be anger, and so that churns it up again. So it's important you learn how to distinguish between the physical symptoms of anger and the actual mental act of anger itself, because they're two different things. You can have the physical symptoms, because after all, the hormones are still there in your bloodstream, even though the actual thought of anger has gone away. An example of having a, a hindrance when you don't think that's there is you start thinking about things and insights into the Dharma seem to be coming and your thoughts go really off into abstraction. Well, that's restlessness. If your thinking pulls you away from the present moment, even if you're thinking about Dharma, it can get in the way of your actually seeing what's going on in the mind. Sometimes an insight comes into the mind, you grab onto it, and you don't wait to see, well, what happens next? Once that insight leaves the mind, what, what's going to replace it? Does it really have a big effect on the mind, or is it just a temporary effect? So to detect these things, you have to be very watchful. Keep the breath as your anchor and as your test of whether you're able to stay with something or not. If staying with a line of thought pulls you away from the breath, you better let it go for the time being. And having the mind with the breath gives these hindrances something to bang up against. In other words, if you don't have something to hold on to solidly here in the present moment, thoughts come into the mind mental qualities, mental states come into the mind, you go along with the flow. And if there's no resistance, you don't really realize that something's happened. It's when part of the mind is trying to stay with the breath and another part seems to be going someplace else. When there's that resistance, you realize something's up, something's happened to the mind. That helps to alert you to what that there's something you've got to look into. So the first step is simply being aware when these things come, when they go. But when they come, you don't just sit there and endure them. You try to figure out how do they come, how do they go? What do you do to put an end to them? In other words, you're not a victim of whatever comes flowing into the mind. And although patience and equanimity are virtues, they're, they're virtues with a proper time and a proper place. And if you're in a situation where you simply cannot figure out anything to do with an unskillful state that comes into the mind, then you watch to see if you can see something you haven't seen before. But a lot of these hindrances are old friends. When anger comes, you know anger. And you know, there are certain tools for dealing with it. The same for sloth and drowsiness, restlessness, uncertainty, sensual desire. There are ways of thinking, there are ways of focusing the mind that can help get around them. For sensual desire, you want to focus on the drawbacks of whatever it is you're getting attracted to. The drawbacks, actually, the object itself may not have main. All those drawbacks, but the fact of being hooked on that object, that has a lot of drawbacks. 
But one of the ways of helping get you unhooked is to look to the negative side of whatever it is. If it's lust, you look for the unattractive side of the body, and there's lots of it there. People are always complaining that Buddhism has a very negative view of the body. Well, when you take the body apart, what have you got? Which part inside the body is something really lovely that you'd like to put on a shelf? And even though there are artists who take body parts and put them in, in museums, it's, it's for their shock value. And so if you find lust coming up in the mind, you try to counteract it. Looking at the parts of the body, thinking what the body is going to be like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years from now. And you find the lust just withers away. Now again, the physical symptoms of lust may still be there, but once the mental state is gone, do your best not to bring it back. Keep thinking about the drawbacks of the object, the drawbacks of the lust itself, and you find that it does begin, everything begins to calm down. When there's ill will or anger, we're often told that goodwill is the antidote for that. It is one of the antidotes. But actually all four of the sublime abidings can function in this way. Equanimity in the sense of reflecting on karma. That if you get involved in wishing ill to other people, what kind of karma is that for you? Where is it going to take you? Does it take you someplace you want to go? Well, not really. And if their karma really is bad, that it'll take care of itself. You don't have to get involved. Each of the hindrances has antidotes. If you're getting sleepy and drowsy, get up and walk around. Change your object of meditation. Meditate on something that wakes you up. It can sometimes simply mean changing the rhythm of your breathing. Sometimes it means changing the object that you're focused on. If you've memorized some chants, repeat the chants in your mind. It's something to get the, the juices flowing. Or you can make a, an object lesson. What is it like? for the, What are the symptoms of drowsiness? How do you know that there's drowsiness in the mind? What are the physical symptoms? What are the mental symptoms? Try to take a catalog of those. And the simple act of trying to take note of things will wake you up. If you find that none of these approaches work, then it's a sign that you the body may really need to rest. So you give it some rest. But you make a mental note in your mind that when you wake up again, you, you'll get up and meditate immediately. You won't just lie around or turn over and take another 40 winks. In other words, you've got to test that particular defilement before you give in. With restlessness, it's often good to focus on how comfortable you can make the breath. Because the, the physical side of a restless mind is a very uncomfortable physical state. So try to smooth things out in the body by the way you breathe. Calm things down. Think of the breath as a soothing energy that can penetrate through every little cell in your body. And work on that. Think of every little corner of the body. Make a survey. If the mind has the energy to think, we'll have it think about the breath energy in the body and making a calming, soothing breath spread everywhere. If a particular issue has you worried, concerned about the future, then remind yourself, if you're going to think through that issue properly, you've got to get the mind to calm down first so that you don't give in to the, the argument, well, this is something that's really important, you've got to think about this, otherwise danger is going to come. Otherwise, it's going to be a disaster. Say, well, let me get the mind in proper shape to think. Then we'll think it through. And return to the breath. As for uncertainty, there's uncertainty about yourself in the practice. There's an uncertainty about the, the practice itself. In the second case, you think about the type of people who've been teaching this practice, who've been keeping it alive all these 2,500 years. What kind of people were they? They weren't the type of people who were out there just to please other people. They'd made all kinds of sacrifices, found the truth, found a way to true happiness inside, and then were willing to share it with anybody else who came along. 
If you can't trust people like that, who are you going to trust? As for doubts about yourself, remind yourself of the Sangha. The sangha of noble disciples throughout the past has been all kinds of people. Old people, young people, men, women, children, well-educated people, people with no education at all. Even cases of people who contemplated suicide, people who just, just a couple of verses in the Taragata and Taragata, people who run amok from their dwelling five or six times, going berserk just because they can't get the mind to settle down. But finally they were able to get it to settle down. In other words, real human beings with real weaknesses, but also some reservoirs of strength that they were finally able to tap into. They could do it. You can do it. When you find the mind is ready to settle down, then stay with the breath. If other things in life are uncertain, at least you can know this. And When the breath is coming in, you know it's coming in. When it goes out, you know it's going out. If you're going to find any certain knowledge in life, you have to start from something that's immediate like this and then build on top of that. So in every case, no matter what the hindrance, no matter what the defilement, don't simply give in to it. You've got to fight it. And if it doesn't work this time, that doesn't mean that it will not work the next time. But at least put up some fight. What we're learning here is called warrior knowledge. Back in the ancient world, they had a distinction between two types of knowledge. There's warrior knowledge and scribe knowledge. Scribe knowledge is the kind of things you can write down, things that can be put into words. And anybody who learns how to write, anybody who learns how to read, can pick up that knowledge. Warrior knowledge, however, is a, is a skill, it's something you learn by doing. And Buddhism makes a similar distinction. There's the insight that comes from listening, which also includes reading, the, list, the insight that comes from thinking. These two correspond to scribe knowledge. And then there's the insight that comes from developing qualities in the mind. As you're trying to develop mindfulness, you learn new things about your mind. You run into specific defilements, but you also find that you discover reservoirs of strength in your mind that you might not have known before through your determination to stick with it. In John Munn's final Dharma talk, he said, one thing you always have to hold on to in the practice, no matter what else you there are lots of things you've got to let go, but one thing you hold on to is your determination to see things through to the end of suffering. That's your inner warrior. And so the knowledge that comes is many times it's unexpected knowledge. You learn things out in the battlefield that you wouldn't learn sitting at a desk in a room someplace. And it's the same with your mind. You can read about sloth and torpor. You can read about all the different hindrances, but it's very different when you've got one right in your mind and it's threatening to take it over. And the question is, are you going to give in or are you going to put up a fight? If you're going to put up a fight, what tools do you have? What approaches do you have? Some of the ones you can learn from the text, but there's a lot you've got to develop on your own. Use your ingenuity. And of course, there are things you can learn simply by being patient and being equanimous about what comes into the mind, but it's not nearly as good as the knowledge you gain when you actually have overcome sloth and top, or actually have overcome sensual desire in your mind. You see what works, and you realize you don't have to sit there and put up with this stuff. You put in some effort, and you get around these unskillful states of mind and de develop skillful states in their stead, and it's a much better place to be. So wisdom doesn't lie in simply accepting things as they come. It lies in seeing what you have to accept and what you don't have to accept. And you don't know the difference unless you try to work your way around unskillful states. It lies, wisdom lies in realizing, realizing how much power you have in the present moment. Some of the things you experience in the present moment come from the past, but there's an awful lot that comes from the present, your intentions right now. And again, you don't know the difference until you try to change your intentions, see what difference that makes. This is a principle we learn as we work with the breath. 
if you simply let the body breathe in and out on its own, it's going to fall into its old habits. And many times those old habits are based on certain expectations that you've developed over time, but you've never really examined. The only way you get to know them is to question them. Try new ways of breathing. Try new ways of conceiving the breathing. Try new ways of focusing. And you find yourself running up against a lot of things in the mind that you hadn't seen before. It's like a scientist. Scientists don't simply watch. They experiment. They try changing the causal conditions in any particular situation to see what, what conditions really make a difference and what conditions don't make a difference. It's through the doing that you gain knowledge. And here the doing is trying to develop skillful qualities in the mind. So take the attitude that you're learning warrior knowledge here. Warriors don't just roll over when someone comes and attacks them. Even if the situation may seem hopeless, at least they try to put up a fight. Now, if they're in a position where they can choose their battles, they do choose them. They don't go out scrapping all the time. But when something comes up and it's unavoidable, they do what they can and find victory in unexpected places. So always keep your warrior alive, that determination that there must be an end to suffering, and if it's possible to find it through human effort, I'm going to do it. That's the attitude that will see you through.